All right, Michael, it's time to start. And I'm so grateful that you're here. Michael has been a presenter for us for almost all of our Faith Forum series, as well as our adult confirmation. And it's always a treat to have him. He is a seasoned educator, and he also is very technologically savvy. So <laughs> enjoy, enjoy what's to come. You know, Oween, by saying that, that you have cursed the technology for this presentation. So <laughs> let's hope it all works well. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Okay. So I wanted to start off really by recalling the various people we have already encountered in the great cloud of witnesses who have been presented so beautifully by all the people in our series, all the teachers in our series. But I wanted to draw some similarities between them and then really only a few differences as we then lead into looking at our next person, as we lead into looking at Mary McLeod Bethune. And one of the things that strikes me is that for the most part, all of these people started off with incredibly humble beginnings. Um, Polly Murray was, it was said she was virtually orphaned and then eventually raised somewhat by her grandmother. Um, Frederick Douglass escaped slavery. Oscar Romero went to a public school that only had grades one, two, and three. That was it. James Weldon Johnson here in Jacksonville, his father was a head waiter down at the St. James Hotel. Um, Jonathan Myrick Daniels, his father was a physician, you know, so he kind of stands out a little bit that way. And then also because he chose to go to the same school of theology that Linda did. So there, there we go. Um, <laughs> But for the most part, these people had very humble beginnings, and there was really nothing about their childhood, nothing about their background that would predict that they would become very influential people in all kinds of areas. This is much the same as is true for Mary Jane McLeod from South Carolina. There was really nothing to indicate that she would grow up to become the incredible influential person that she is. Um, one thing though that did connect all of these people is education. No matter what their beginning is, no matter what their status in life, somehow they were able to forge an education. Um, you know, I mentioned Oscar Romero only had a public school that went to grades three, but then until the age of 13, he was tutored by an individual person. Harriet Bedell went to the training school for deaconesses in New York. Polly Murray, the, the one who was orphaned and then raised by grandmother, well, at 16, she moved to New York City and went to Hunter College, which at that time was a women's normal school or training school for teachers. Um, Frederick Douglass, he really just had kind of a stroke of luck because he was given by one of his owners to his brother, to the brother of that owner, and that brother's wife, for some reason, took an interest in Frederick Douglass, and she tutored him. She taught him one-on-one. -on -one. So all of these people are connected by the fact that no matter what their beginning was like, no matter what kind of family they had or childhood, education really became the way that they were then able to have such a great impact on the world. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention about the great cloud of witnesses. And the next thing is, as we now go to look at Mary McLeod Bethune, is that she's technically not part of the great cloud of witnesses. Uh, she is not officially on the calendar for the Episcopal Church. Um, and Oween, you might speak for just a moment there. Is it Father Bob? Who is it that is pushing an idea of suggesting local people for this great cloud? It actually is in the book, Great Cloud of Witnesses, that we in the Episcopal tradition would uh, begin to look around us in, in our own bodies of Christ and find people 
that have been raised up that should be recognized as participants in that cloud. Um, but it is Joe O'Shields and his EFM group who um, put EFM on hold and became a sacred ground group this fall, this uh, late summer and fall, who have decided that their next effort together is going to be to look around our community, the greater Jacksonville area, the Diocese of Florida, and look for people who would be appropriate members of that great cloud of witnesses. Okay. All right. And so with that introduction, we can then move on to um, Mary Jane McLeod, who was born July 1875. And I want you to really, really take in that cabin where she was born. You see two adult people standing outside of it. So you get an idea about the cabin, um, certainly very plain. But the other thing I want you to focus on is its size because uh, Mary Jane was the 15th of her parents' 17 children. And so this was a, an abode for a family of 19, um, which is just amazing to me. I do not know that this cabin is still in existence. The photo is quite old. Um, there is in Maysville, which is a, a small town due east of Columbia, South Carolina, uh, there is a um, institute, a museum about Mary McLeod Bethune, um, and it's ironically in the old school building, but it was a school that she couldn't attend since she was colored, um, but that's where the museum is in Maysville. Now, here's a picture of her parents, Samuel and Patsy McIntosh McLeod. Um, I'm not sure that I get from their faces that they are the parents of 17 children, um, but that is nonetheless the case. Uh, and so this is where she is from. She was born in the years following the Civil War um, in rural South Carolina. And all of her family were very hard workers. For the most part, they picked cotton. And yet there was something about Mary Jane that gave the McLeods reason to think she should perhaps be educated. Um, the um, options at that time were really very, very few. Um, her parents had been formerly enslaved. They were now free, but they were formerly enslaved. They certainly didn't have much in the way of money. And there weren't really places for colored children to go, boys or girls to go, until Trinity Presbyterian Church um, founded a mission school about a few miles from where the McLeods lived. And somehow a connection was made. A Quaker woman in Colorado took an interest in Mary Jane McLeod, somehow learned about her. And so Mary Jane went to this mission school for African-American children. She had to walk five miles a day to get there. And this school nurtured not only her um, education and topics like reading and mathematics, but especially in the area of faith foundation. Um, it, it was a mission school founded by Trinity Presbyterian. The primary text in many cases was the Bible. And so not only was she then able within her own family to read the Bible to them, but she used her math skills to make sure that they were not being cheated in their business deals. Um, so she was using her education immediately for the sake of her family. Now this lasted for a while, but then the Quaker woman in Colorado actually provided a scholarship for Mary to go to an institution called the Scotia Seminary for Girls. This is in Concord, North Carolina. It's operated by the Presbyterian Church. And I think actually I have a 
first want you to read something. Mary McLeod Bethune always was in mind that any advantages that she had, she owed to other people. And so she certainly lived that out. Now, here's a picture of Scotia Seminary for Girls in Concord, North Carolina. Um, one of the amazing things about it is it was more than 100 miles from her home in Maysville. Um, and so it, it, we're talking about in the late 1800s, a teenaged black girl traveling this distance on her own to go to school. The, the, the spirit of this woman just fascinates me. Um, I did, I couldn't help but notice, and I kind of blew it up over here to the side um, as she is passing through Let's see here. As she is on her journey right here, that's the area that I've blown up and she passes through Bethune. So Mary Jane McLeod had to pass through Bethune to get to Barbara Scotia College. I just think that somehow that's just a little, you know, foreshadowing. <laughs> now, Scotia Seminary for Girls merged with the Barber Institute, which actually had been in Birmingham, Alabama, and it did Barbara relocated to the Concord campus. Um, and Barber Scotia was the first historically black institution of higher education established after the Civil War. Um, and this is where Mary Jane McLeod continued her learning until 1893. So she was 18 years old when she graduated from here. Um, from that point, she then was interested in what she might do to continue her education, and she also had professed a membership in the Presbyterian Church after her years of association, both with the mission school that was operated by Trinity Presbyterian, and then um, Scotia College, which was operated by the Presbyterian Church, or affiliated with the Presbyterian Church. And so she went to the, um, what's, it, it's got a more lengthy and formal name, but it's generally referred to as the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. <clears throat> and the Moody Bible Institute has a primary role of preparing people for mission work. And so that was her interest in it. Now, when I say that I'm fascinated by the spirit of this woman, there were at that time seven to 800 students at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, and Mary Jane McLeod was the only black student there at all, out of seven to eight hundred people, and it just amazes me that she just saw no obstacles that couldn't be overcome. Um, now, she finished at um, the Moody Bible Institute and then met with one of the greatest disappointments in her life. The Presbyterian Missions Board would not approve an assignment for her to go um, to a mission site. She had chosen one in Africa, but would not approve it because she was black. Um, and this was just incredibly disappointing to her. This is what she had prepared to do. And frankly, this is what Moody prepared people to do. She took that disappointment though and she decided to turn her energy into teaching. Um, and she returned to the South to do that. She first taught at a small school in Augusta, Georgia, right on the South Carolina border. And then at a small school in Sumter, South Carolina. <clears throat> and at that school, she met another teacher named Albertus Bethune. And in 1898, so, um, she was 23 at the time. In, 18, in 1898, she married Albertus Bethune. They were both teachers. They had one son, Albert McLeod Bethune. Um, and then there's not a whole lot else written about that relationship, except that in 1907, the marriage ended. 
and I'm sharing with you the same phrasing that I encountered. I didn't find the word divorce, so it's possible they legally divorced, but all it says is that in 1907, the marriage ended. Um, you know, this is quite interesting to me that in the early 1900s, a woman with a child would choose to strike out on a path of, of living on her own. So she really had a very independent spirit. Now, before the marriage ended in 1907, uh, Mary and Albertus had moved to Florida. She was they were both teaching at a school in South Carolina, but she had a strong urge to found a school of her own. She actually went first to Palatka for a very, very brief time, and then she went to Daytona. When I read quotes like this from Mary McLeod Bethune, I have to continually remind myself this was a woman speaking in the early 1900s. Um, and just, I, I can't imagine the reception she must have received on some fronts. This is a picture of Mary McLeod Bethune. She started in 1904. Her very, very first effort was a rented cabin and she had five girls in her school. That was it. Um, but now this is Mary McLeod Bethune as the principal and lead teacher with her students lined up. Um, and this is in Daytona. And then um, the school, as a school of any size would have to, would have its own farm to help supply it. And so you see here, you know, cows, a mule, a horse. Now you do see several males in this picture. They were hired workmen. Um, because at this time the school was for girls only. Um, and so any males that there were hired workmen at this time, but that does change in the not too distant future. Um, it was also Mary's intent that graduates of her school could not only, you know, take their place in raising families and being productive members of the community, but also in being somewhat self-sufficient. So while many of her sponsors thought it wonderful that she taught her students domestic skills, Mary's idea was that she was teaching them um, skills which would provide them employment. And so she was perfectly happy to include sewing and needlework in her school along with other academic subjects because she knew that they would be able to gain employment in those areas when they finish their school work. And then this was a picture of her at a, in about 1911. I'm not quite sure of the, of the years on her the time, but this is about 1911. Um, <clears throat> I don't know your reaction, but to me, she looks incredibly determined. I don't think I would want to tell this woman no. And then this is a few years later, and it does show, you know, you know, her hair is beginning to, to have some gray in it. But other than that, really not a whole lot of age difference. Um, you know, she was, she was a very attractive woman for all of her life. But this was during the time in the early years of the, 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 the Daytona Normal Institute for Negro Girls. Now, a quote first, then a little history. If nothing else, what this quote does for me is to show how well imbued her own Christian foundation was with her 
teaching and her political views, you know, gaining equality in education, in the vote, in economic opportunity, those might be considered to be political issues. But when she talks about full equality and the abundance of life, she is harking back to her upbringing in the church and her knowledge of the Bible. So the name Cookman, it might be familiar to some of you from the Jacksonville area. We have a school um, near UF Shands Hospital, the Darnell Cookman School. And the Cookman name comes from a Methodist minister who um, back in the 1800s donated money for a school to be founded. And then the Darnell was another Methodist minister who's the one who actually founded the school, who took the gift of Reverend Cookman um, and founded the Cookman Institute um, in 1872 in Jacksonville, and this was for Negro boys. Um, and so the Cookman Institute was for Negro boys, that was in Jacksonville. The Daytona Normal Institute was for Negro girls, and that was in Daytona. And then in 1923, those two institutes merged they merged onto the campus in Daytona because although Mary McLeod Bethune began in a single rented cabin with five girls, by the time, um, just about 15 years later, she had purchased 20 acres in Daytona and there were three very impressive permanent full-size buildings on the campus. And so when the two schools merged, they did so at the Daytona Normal Institute campus, which then became the Cookman. Um, the Cookman Institute remained in Jacksonville and it's what we now call Darnell Cookman School. It's on the same site, it's not the same building, but it's on the same site as the original Cookman Institute was. Now, this is fast forwarding a little because now you can see that fashions have changed a little bit. <clears throat> um, the young ladies in Daytona are dressing differently and smiling more. <clears throat> so while earlier lives, they may have been a little bit grim in the photographs, now they're, now they're actually smiling. So hopefully things are looking up for all the folks at Bethune-Cookman. This is a picture of Mary McLeod Bethune in front of <clears throat> her house, which is on the campus. The house is still there, but serves as a museum today. Um, and, and, but this is where she lived when she was in Daytona. And then this was an early picture of the building that's named Whitehall um, with Mary McLeod Bethune in front of it, a number of students in the area behind her, but that is Whitehall. Uh, and then here's a picture, a more modern picture today. I do not know exactly when it's from. The only thing I noted that was of interest is that the flag is at half mast. So I don't know what reason that is because I don't know exactly what date the picture is. But this is a more modern view of Whitehall um, which is still one of the primary buildings on the Bethune-Cookman campus. And then the um, seal for the, for the university, 1872, this is when um, Cookman Institute in Jacksonville was founded. 1904 is when the Daytona Normal Institute for Negro Girls was founded by Mary McLeod Bethune. 1923 is then the year that they came together. And it went through several names. It wasn't immediately called Bethune-Cookman. It went through several names. It became Bethune-Cookman College in the 1940s. And then this last date that's on here, 2007, 2007 is when the school had added a master's level program. And so therefore, um, since they now offer graduate degrees, the board changed the name to Bethune-Cookman University, which is the name it still holds today. So the, the dates on the seal are the significant dates of the founding of the separate girls' school and boys' school, the joining together of the two schools, and then the renaming and rebranding as Bethune-Cookman University. Now, <clears throat> Mary McLeod Bethune was definitely an educator. 
but she was also a civil rights leader, a political activist, a presidential advisor. And one of the ways that she tried to expand education and services to all people, even back when this was the Daytona Normal Institute for Girls, and I mentioned that she had a 20 acre campus, this was about by the end of World War I, around 1918, 1919. She had the 20 acre campus with the three fairly impressive permanent buildings. She also had either built or purchased an additional building that was a little bit of a distance away from the others. Um, and that was for the education of boys or men in the Daytona area. So as much as she was committed to the Daytona Institute for Negro Girls, she really knew that education was the way forward for all people to develop in their um, economic opportunities. And so she also established this building for the education of boys and men that was a little bit of a distance away from the rest of the campus. The merger of the Cookman Institute with the Thune School was also how it um, gained its United Methodist Church affiliation uh, because of the um, Methodist background of both the Reverend Darnell who founded the Cookman Institute and the Reverend Cookman who donated the money for it. Uh, and it still maintains that affiliation today with the Methodist school. Now, before and after the merger with Cookman, uh, it was Mary McLeod Bethune who served as the school's president. And in fact, she continued that, uh, continued working with the school until 1942, 38 years after founding the school. So she was the head of that school for all of that time. Beyond um, her interest in education though, Mary McLeod Bethune was active on a number of fronts. She became involved with an organization called the National Association of Colored Women and was the president of the Florida chapter of that organization. And this association lobbied for advancement in education um, advancement in healthcare. Um, they really um, worked trying to grow their voice in calling for these changes. Uh, then in 1924, um, Mary McLeod Bethune became the national leader of the National Association of Colored Women. And you might recognize the name of the woman whom she defeated for this office. That was a woman named Ida B. Wells. Um, it, in, in trying to explain Mary's interest outside of just education, she believed very strongly, as you've seen in the quotes that we've had, about equality and opportunities. So it came to her attention in Daytona that one of her students had been turned away from a hospital because he was Black. And... <laughs> having no background in this area at all, Mary McLeod Bethune opened a hospital, uh, the McLeod Hospital in Daytona, to serve the Black people in the Daytona and beyond area. Um, it, it just, her, her interest, her, she was just not intimidatable. There was nothing that she saw as an obstacle that couldn't be overcome. So she not only lobbied for improved health care for people of, for Negro people. She founded the hospital for them. Now, beyond the um, work with the National Association for Colored Women, Mary McLeod Bethune was also recognized by three different presidents for Calvin Coolidge, who, who served in office from 1923 to 1929, she was asked to serve on a conference for child welfare, and she did that. His successor, Herbert Hoover, appointed her to the Commission on Home Building and Home Ownership. Um, and then it was really with Franklin Delano Roosevelt that she became a special advisor. And you see Mary McLeod Bethune here with Eleanor Roosevelt in 1937. She became a special advisor to him on minority affairs and became the director of the Division of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration 
And this made her the first black woman to ever be the director of a federal level operation. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a real trust in Mary McLeod Bethune and he welcomed her to the White House and listened to her and, and took counsel from her. During this time when she was helping to be an advisor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, she also started an organization called the National Council, National Council of Negro Women. Now, what this was trying to do, I mentioned before the National Association of Colored Women, there were all kinds of organizations in various areas around the country, and they all, in many cases, had some similar ideals, ideas, some similar goals. And so she started this National Council of Negro Women um, to be a civil rights group that really acted as an umbrella and drew all of those together. And she was quite aware that your voice increases in effect when it increases in volume. And so by joining these various organizations together under the umbrella of the National Council of Negro Women, she really pushed forward that agenda. The, um, this is a picture in the late 1940s of Mary McLeod Bethune with her family. So on the left is her son, Albert, and then to his, between he and his mother, Mary McLeod Bethune, is Albert's son, Albert Jr. So that's Mary's grandson. And then to her left is a niece of hers, and then also a foster son. Um, I don't, it, it, you know, I, I hadn't, this picture is the only indication I ever saw that she had foster children, but somehow that didn't surprise me. If you grew up in a household of 17 children, I don't think um, if you see that there's a child in need and you therefore take him in your home, I just don't find that as a stretch. I find that as something that's pretty expected. Uh, and I also find that it would mesh with something that happened to Mary when she was still quite young. <clears throat> One day when she was with her mother going to the home where her mother had previously been a slave, and the mother was no longer a slave, and Mary was certainly not a slave, but had previously been a slave there. Mary was looking in the room, which obviously a, a child, a young lady lived in, and there were books and toys and other things, and she was just kind of wandering around and looking. And the young woman who lived there came in and said, no, those aren't for you because you can't read. And so she took her over to some picture books instead of books that had words in them. And this just absolutely got to Mary Jane McLeod. She took that as inspiration to learn to read. And she actually, though, the way she approached it, she centered her prayer life on improving her education. She thought, if I, if I make this request of God, then this will come true. So that's what she centered her prayer life on at that time. And the results are pretty amazing all these years later. Mary McLeod Bethune is the uh, second from the left here and she's receiving an award from President Harry S. Truman um, along with the ambassador to, from India and Dr. Ralph Bunch of the United Nations. Um, and so her influence continued um, to yet another president. And so now we're up to our fourth one. And then this is one of my rather favorite images because this is Mary McLeod Bethune entering the White House. You know, she was often went there as an advisor or something else. But on one of the occasions, there's a, a story about it that as she was coming in, one of the white guards who was there called her auntie. And she apparently just simply stopped and in a very level and low voice turned to him and said, now, which of my brother's children are you? And then this is a picture of Mary McLeod Bethune in the 1950s. She died in 1955 in Daytona. Now, at that time, though, she had a house in Washington because of all the work that she was doing. She had not worked for the university since 1942. So while she still maintained a residence in Daytona, she had a house in Washington. 
um, because she was advising the president, she was serving on commission, she was doing other things. That house still exists today. The National Park Service has taken it over and it serves as a memorial, but also as an, a very educational museum about the life of Mary McLeod Bethune, but also about all the things that she was interested in, about all the things that she was passionate about. Um, and it's, it's rather significant that there is a statue in Washington of Mary McLeod Bethune. There's also this National Park Service house of hers. And in both cases, she's the first black woman to have these things, these memorials in the District of Columbia. Now on this page, I left the um, quote until the end. As a fellow educator, I tell you the one that really speaks to me is the one where she says, I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another. Um, it, it is just so important that we learn to leverage our own strengths to help other people, but also learn when we can take from other people, when we can gain from their strengths. So I really, really do that one resonates with me. I'm going to try now, I don't know how well this will do over Zoom, but I'm going to try to play a fairly brief video. Now, are you seeing that? I can hear it, but are you seeing it? Okay. Let's see if I can find it. prestigious woman of a wisdom prestigious and determination, wisdom a distinguished and educator and civil rights leader, best known for starting to black students. Okay. students Hang on students on just a second. That eventually became that Duncan-Cookman University. Duncan and for being a government advisor to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Mary McLeod Bethune won Mary social and political gains so black during the first half of black 20th century. Bethune was born in 1875 in rural South Carolina to perform a South Carolina with the resentment of having to work in the field from the age of five. She took an early interest in her own education. She was awarded a scholarship to North Carolina Seminary School, as well as a missionary school. All right. I think I've got it now, where it will only play once. A prestigious woman of wisdom and determination, a distinguished educator and civil rights leader, best known for her starting a school for black students in Daytona Beach, Florida, that eventually became Bethune Cookman University. And for being a government advisor to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Mary McLeod Bethune won many social and political gains for blacks during the first half of the 20th century. Bethune was born in 1875 in rural South Carolina to former slaves. With the resentment of having to work in the fields from the age of five, she took an early interest in her own education. She was awarded a scholarship to North Carolina Seminary School, as well as a missionary school in Chicago. After completion, she returned to the South to become a teacher. She was also active in the Women's Club, and her leadership in allowed them to become a nationally prominent organization. Bethune worked for the election campaign of Franklin Roosevelt in 1932 and became a member of Roosevelt's Black Cabinet, advocating for and being the communicator between Black people and the Roosevelt administration, spreading Roosevelt's message to Blacks who had been traditionally Republican voters. 
while fighting for equal educational rights for blacks. Bethune presided over a number of black women's organizations and became the first black woman to head a federal agency. In 1936, she was named director of the Divisions of Negro Affairs in the National Youth Administration. With this appointment, she joined other prominent blacks in forming a presidential advisory board that became known as the nation's first black cabinet. A tireless, inspirational leader, Mary McLeod Bethune devoted all her life to promoting black educational achievement. We are blessed with the path she has carved out for our history in black. All right. Um, I, since that video is fairly short, I thought we could look at it together. Um, and I also, in thinking, and, and you know, when you're focused on one thing, because I've been doing a lot of reading on Mary McLeod Bethune lately, um, and something very much struck me last night in President-elect Biden's speech to us, when he recalled a memory from his youth of growing up in Scranton, and when he would be leaving his grandparents' house, his grandfather would always say to him, you know, Joey, keep the faith. And then his grandmother would speak up immediately and say, no, Joey, spread the faith. Um, and when I think about the life of Mary McLeod Bethune, this is exactly what I think of. She was keeping her own faith, but she was spreading it as far and wide as she could in a variety of ways. Now, um, you know, I'm a teacher, so you're not getting out of here without an assignment. We have a class effort to do now. Um, let's see here. All right. So a collect, a brief pair, prayer brings together several different ideas, but it has a fairly specific format. First, there's an address. You begin by naming God and describing some of God's character or actions. The middle part, which is often the most lengthy part, is the section that asks for something. And I really love the way that th this particular one expressed it. It said that um, you, the idea is to think about why we're asking for something. And then the last part of a collect is praise. It offers praise of God. It often invokes the Trinity. Um, but it states the basis on which we're making the request, as in stating, you know, we are children of God, or you know, what is the basis on which we're making this request. So this is kind of just a, you know, a short introduction of what a collect is. But then this, on this other one, there's a template, you know, that you can follow to write your own collect. Um, it, it follows a basic format, and so you can follow this exact one. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is, as I mentioned in the very first part of the presentation, Mary McLeod Bethune is not actually in the great cloud of witnesses yet. She's not on the Episcopal calendar. Therefore, there's no collect for her or about her. And so that's what we're going to take a few minutes to do. We're going to write a collect. And it could be either in honor of Mary McLeod Bethune or it could be in support of those ideas that she held important. It could be either one. So anybody wish to make a suggestion about something we might want to say? One thing that makes me think of is the work that needs to be done on educating ourselves um, about unlearning racism just for the country um, that we might learn more mm -hmm. from each other. Um, so that's, that's where my head goes first. Um, I'd just like to add um, to, to not only the work that, that Linda <laughs> mentioned, but oh God, you are so inclusive. And here we are so polarized right now. And the, the, the people that Mary mentioned in the, the, uh, the quotes that you had, um, Michael, it just said to me inclusiveness. She wanted all all peoples to excel in education and um, in faith and so forth. So, 
Thank you, Michael, for all the time you've put into this preparation. Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot. Michael, okay. I, just, I just looked in my in my great cloud of witnesses and there's nothing on July 10th. So I think we're gonna designate that day for Mary McLeod Bethune and we will, um, I'm gonna put this, whatever collect we put together here in my book on a post-it note and share it with Joe. Okay. <coughs> All right, now I'm taking your ideas so far. We're, we started off with our naming of God. You are so inclusive. All peoples are formed in your image and are dear to you. Now, what might we ask? Linda, Linda, put what you said in a, in a phrase that we might put for what we might ask. That, that we help each other. I seem to recall you specifically mentioned learn from each other. Yeah. And educate, Linda said, educate ourselves. And I, I think um, there's a, a real dearth of that going on right now. People are not educating themselves and they're making ridiculous statements that aren't backed up with data and fact. Now, what from Mary McLeod Bethune's life and the things we've talked about today and the quotes you've seen what should we be educating ourselves in? What were some of the ideals that she really held well, important? Part of it was that abundant life for everyone, uh, the seeking of abundant, abundant life, but it was... Um, and, and the roadblocks, you know, Linda, the roadblocks to education. Yeah. The power and what comes to mind for me is the power of the unions. Yeah. But the other thing about her, Michael, that you brought out so well was that if she saw a need, she just met it. You know, there's something so that, you know, uh, so that the needs of all, um, if this has an action component to it, I'm, I'm not really good at prayers on the fly, but, you know, for somebody who saw that there was no, no school and provided one, there was no hospital and provided one, um, I, that's just uh, health, yeah. There, there are two buzzwords that the DuPont Fund is really uh, stressing in all of its uh, program, uh, programs and institutions that it's backing nowadays. And the two words are placemaking and equity. Yeah. And so they, they want, and placemaking means that everybody in a community has an equal shot. So the person living next door to you has, has the same opportunities as you do. And that's not the way it is now. No. So placemaking and equity is, is what I'm hoping will result. And that, that's, I'm not giving placemaking a, a very fair shot here, but, but that's a really important word right now. Michael, <clears throat> excuse me, would you roll back to remind me of that very last quote that you presented? Okay. Or read it or... Yeah, let me do that in just a second. Betsy, Betsy what at, was at, at placemaking and equity. equity? Okay, and then um, you wish to see the last quote. All right. There was a piece of that that I thought might be appropriate in this call it. Okay. Um, hang on just a second. Let me go back to the one note. Um, maybe the piece that I guess that's what I'm thinking of the piece that you highlighted the challenge of developing confidence in one another. Um, 
that is resonating with me as well. Um, I'm, I'm at a place where I'm very open and happy to have all of these racial um, equity discussions. What I'm, what I'm really more charged to do or to, to participate in is just becoming friends, knowing, developing relationships with many people. Um, outside of conversation about systemic racism, I am developing relationships with people of colors that are different from mine and enjoying the, the blend of humanity that's coming into my space um, without big conversations about history and um, that's been what this last several weeks has been for me is, is simply becoming people of a world that has a variety of experiences and backgrounds without the conversation of looking back and fixing. I, anyway, that's my current place of consciousness is to let go of all of that baggage and I don't mean it's not important I'm very focused on how important it is but I'm really enjoying this new space of knowing people for their life experiences okay, okay. I'm done and Laura, what I particularly appreciate about that contribution is that actually puts some of Mary McLeod Bethune's words in this collect. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, now, who should we acknowledge to, to close this? How do see, we want to my, pray? Michael, I, ha I have a problem uh, with God comes from a remembering that Jesus connects us because that leaves out the Buddhists, the, the, uh, the Jews, the Muslims, and I don't know, any, anybody else feel that way? I do understand your concern, I, but since these colleagues are written for Episcopal services, I'm not sure that I'm bothered by it in this context. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, I'll agree with that. But think of a phrasing that that works. I don't see that it swept them out at all. I didn't hear what you said. I said I don't see that that uh, statement has left out the people that you're talking about. Um, remembering that Jesus connects us. How about humanity connects us? Jesus is the one that taught us. Well, it, 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 Betsy, isn't what you're contemplating captured in the uh, second line of the paragraph there where it says, God help us to provide placemaking and equity for all people? Yeah, yeah, you're I mean, right, Bill. Heart you're heart right, Kelly. Um, maybe we could say something like through, through um, the Holy One who makes more of us all. Something that um, is expansive. I don't, I don't know. Does that help you? Mm -hmm. Or that we might live into the full gift of humanity. Humanity and how about community? Yeah, because that that would go back to the place making and equity for all people. <laughs> I, I don't know. Y'all are right. This is a, a Christian body. So therefore, um, it, it's written for for us. But still, I just have a problem with it. That's all.
The one word I see that we've left out is love. Yeah, you're you're right. You're right. It's not anywhere. Mm -hmm. All right. Can we live with connected that we are connected as humanity as deeply as the Trinity connects the persons of God? I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, because that includes the love. It also calls on our faith tradition, which is important. Yes. All right. Now, I'm very mindful of the time because some of us need to get to service online. Um, and I just want to thank you all very much for being such an audience and also for contributing so much to our joint project. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Michael. This was exceptional. And how wonderful to have an assignment at the end and something that we can take away and put into our great cloud of witnesses. So I, I appreciate it so much. Next week, um, a young woman that we have met in our um, community of faith named Kirby Oberdor is going to be presenting about the liberators and prophets of the women's movement in the early 1920s. And um, I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. So God's peace. Um, let us go out into the world to serve, love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks Amen. be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.